All right, well, in today's lesson, we're going to talk about um, the United Kingdom of Israel. Um, Saul was the first king, and Hosea was the, uh, was the last king of Israel. Okay, now I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. Um, so after, after the time of the Judges, which is sometime around 1300 to 1050, um, we get to the time of, of Israel no longer being tribes with, with you know, specific people or judges ruling or something like that. It more turns into, starts beginning to turn into a kingdom. Now, if you remember, um, Genesis covers from the beginning of time, whenever that is, to about 1400 or 1200, um, somewhere in there. Um, and then Exodus, you know, kind of summates 400 years and goes immediately into um, kind of a, a long history of, of Israel's beginnings. Um, pretty, the, the 400 years of, of slavery, um, the 400 years in, in the foreign land, that's not really recorded. Just kind of hops out over that to get to the um, rise of Moses and that kind of stuff. Um, and then you, you've got Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and, and Joshua that all happen pretty much back to back. And then you get to the books of Judges, which once again takes a huge amount of time and, and compresses it very, very succinctly. Um, so then the kingdom starts with King Saul around 1050 or so. Um, and and uh, King David reigns after him and then King Solomon after him. And so they three reign from about 1050 to 930, each one after the other. Um, they didn't reign at the same time. Um, but then in 930... When Solomon's son uh, Rehoboam takes takes the throne, um, the the nation is divided uh, between north and south, uh, Israel and Judah. So uh, that's about 9:30, and that goes down to about 7:22. But in 7:22, um, Israel uh, falls. The northern kingdom falls, and that's to Assyria. Uh, and then um, Judah doesn't fall. Till almost 150 years later, in 586. Um, I mean that that's a that's a good deal of time. Um, at the time of this recording, it's 2015. Even even you know 100 years ago, you know 1915. That that was a long time ago. You know, um, with the you know things were starting to change in the West from you know. Um, Horses and that kind of stuff, and then cars being invented and all these different stuff. I mean, that was that was only a hundred year, hundred or so years ago. So you know, 150 years, a lot can happen in 150 years. Um, so in the prophets, uh, God's going to bring that up and say, you know, you didn't you didn't follow the example. I mean, you followed the example of, of your sister Israel, and you know, you didn't learn anything from them. Um, and, and so it's it's easy to just kind of gloss over that. But remember, this was 150 years later. So, um, it's during the, this time of, uh, of of the United Kingdom between uh, Saul, David, and Kingdom, and, and Saul, David, and Solomon, that um, Song of Songs is written, Ecclesiastes, and Proverbs. Now, obviously, the majority of those were written, at least largely, by King Solomon, uh, and so that. Uh, but it, it, I want to point something out here. Um, so those books all come from somewhere around, you know, 940 or so. Um, Assyria, remember I had said that, that in Mesopotamia was really the land of empires. And so Assyria, the people of Nineveh and whatnot had been fighting with different people and whatnot for a while. And they really had their rise around the 890s, okay? So what happened between 890 and 722? Well, actually a good deal of stuff happened. Um, they rose to power. They bullied um, Israel. They um, kind of went to this time of lax where they didn't really control their empire very well. Um, kind of like a lapse of power. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, and then they had a second wind, uh, you know, where they had a resurgence of power um, before falling in 609, where their capital fell in 612, but they, they were finally done for in 609. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens. So when Jonah goes to to tell, um, you know, to to preach to Nineveh in around 770, um, he, the Assyria was in its decline of power, um, and but they had been um, bullies to Israel before. So he's obviously still 
prejudiced against them. And then God tells him to go, and he's like, eh, no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then he ends up going. Um, so then Amos, there is a prophet from, uh, in about 760. Hosea from about 760 to 730. Um, Isaiah was from 70, 740 right before the fall of Israel to 700 after the fall of Israel. Um, and Micah is a prophet from 737 to 690. So if you look at the, at the order of events here, you've got Saul, David, Solomon, no prophet from the prophet books, from the major or minor prophets. Um, but then you get down to the kingdom when the kingdom is divided, and you know it's it's like 150 years, and they've got a pro one of the first of the prophets, Jonah, you know, and then you've got Amos and Hosea and Isaiah and Micah. Um, but it is important to note that remember I, I mentioned this in one of the introduction uh, lessons um, that there were still prophets. There are prophets in the time of King David, uh, you know, Nathan the prophet is is one of the ones that's kind of a mention a lot. Um, when the kingdom is first divided, there's some prophets that go to Israel. Um, and then um, uh, you've got Elijah and Elisha from the books of Kings. You know, and all throughout the books of, I think it's Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, uh, it says, um, you know, this was taken from the prophecies of this man or, you know, this man or whatever. Um, and so prophets were, were obviously... Um, a tool of God's hands, and just because the recorded prophets, um, they have their own books, uh, all happen later doesn't mean that, you know, God wasn't giving any warnings. So, once again, this was the ideal of, of how the tribal allotments were supposed to be. Um, in fact, this map doesn't even show how far it was supposed to have gone. It was supposed to go up to the river up here. Um, but, you know, obviously that really didn't didn't happen. So that takes us to the books of First and Second Samuel. Now, First and Second Samuel follow right after each other. The events of First Samuel pick up pretty much at the end of the time of the Judges. The events of Second Samuel, Second Samuel, pick up pretty much at the end of First Samuel. Um, so it was probably tradition-wise, it was written by Samuel and his disciples. Um, obviously, Samuel couldn't have written all of it um, because he dies in First Samuel. So. Um, it, tradition said that he and, he and his disciples wrote it. Um, he was he was the last judge of Israel, and um, uh, once again, uh, it's unclear as to whether there were any other judges at the time that he was that he was the judge or whatnot. But First Samuel seven fifteen <clears throat> says now Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and then in eight ten to twenty two. He gives a warning to the people about what will happen when they get a king. Um, because they come to him and they say, we want a king. And you know, he, he gives them this warning and they say, you know what, we still want this king. So why were they so set on this king? First off, uh, a king was, was, was a sign of protection. Remember, they had growing empires all around them. They had growing kingdoms all around them. Uh, things were getting, to put it in a weird kind of way, more serious. Even in, the, even in the land of Canaan, which had, you know, all these tribes and all these different, you know, just chaotic kind of structure to it, people were starting were starting to be afraid of the growing power in Mesopotamia. They were starting to be afraid of, of, of you know, the growing powers in Egypt. People started realizing more and more with time that that it was very dangerous. And, and so they wanted this, this idea of protection. But they also wanted this idea of identity. All the other kings, I mean, all the other kingdoms had these kings that gave them identity. And they, gave, and they had these things that, that made them a people and made them safe and made them a homeland. And they just had this. And Israel wanted this. So rather than doing what God told them to do, where the land would be completely theirs, you know, once again, they failed to kick out the other people. Uh, but then also... Um, uh, they they reject God and that they want a human solution for their spiritual problem. Um, so Saul is exactly what the people want. People say, well, why did God, why did God um, an anoint Saul when he knew that he was going to mess up? First off, it's important to note that God always gives a chance. He doesn't judge you for something that you haven't even done yet. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, Saul did have potential, and he did have the image of a good of a good king um, he was he, he had the looks he was um, he was tall 
you know, he was strong, uh, but he overlooked God. And, and so, once again, this is obviously a very, very good, very good lesson for people. It's not about the looks that count. It's about um, someone being, um, being a seeker of God. And the same thing applies for today. Is this person going to be a good CEO of this company? Do they look the part or do they have the heart? See what I mean? Um, there's more to business than just simply being business-minded. Um, obviously, a lot of people would, would say that's not true, but and yet it still seems to be. So Saul reigned from about 1050, 1030, somewhere in there, to 1010. Now, Saul, from what we can tell, never really had complete control uh, over, um, over Israel. But it's interesting how he's introduced. In chapter 9, you know, you have this, this guy is all big and handsome and everything, and um, he's out there looking for donkeys. It's almost comical. He, he's, he's walking around and just, he's like a dope out there looking for these, for these, for these donkeys. And, you know, it, it's, it's just interesting how it introduces him. And then King David, on the other hand, is introduced as this guy that's just out there, you know, even overlooked by his own father, um, taking care of sheep. You know, there's a lot of um, ideas about David's origins and whether he was a illegitimate child or whatnot. Um, there is nothing that is supported in the Bible of that, so I'm not going to really touch on that other than this. It needs to be established that just because something is of Jewish origin does not make it true. Some people think that these rabbis nowadays have all the answers to, to the Old Testament. But remember, Jews neglect the most important aspect of the Old Testament, the Messiah. And so once again, it, it's important to, to notice that rabbis don't have all the answers, just the same as no person has all the answers. Um, so, um, 28, 3 through 7 says, Now Saul, Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had removed from the land those who were mediums and spiritists. So the Philistines gathered together and came together and, ca and camped at Shunem. And Saul gathered at Israel together, and they camped in Gilboa. So, you know, Saul gets Saul gets scared here. Um, and, and, and God won't answer him, and so he's just kind of blocked off from God. Um, you know, he did all this stuff in, in his reign to neglect God and to not mend that and he just always overlooked God and then when it came down to the to the end of it you know he's wanting God to God to speak to him it's the exact same thing with us we we don't we don't seek after God we don't make him the desire of our heart and then we we want him when we're in a pickle well worshiping God is more than than getting your wishes worshiping God is about seeking him on a day-to-day -day basis, regardless of, of whether you're at a time in your life where you think that you're fine or whether you think that you, you need a lot of help. It's a lifestyle. So then David is anointed, but not king. God has, oh, I want you to be king. You know, he, he anoints him, and nothing happens. Oh, well, if it's of God, it'll happen right away, or, and there'll be no problems, and it'll all just work out. Well, I beg to differ. Uh, David, on the other hand, was almost killed multiple times. He was chased out of his own home. Uh, he was—he had to ally himself with the, um, I mean, ally himself with the enemies. You know, he, he had to do all these different things, and he still wasn't king. So, First Samuel, the book of First Samuel ends, and he is still not king when he was, you know, anointed sometime around like the 15th or 16th chapter. Let me see. Um, yeah, in the 16th chapter, he's anointed king. And yet we don't see him actually become king until the beginning of 2 Samuel. Um, so obviously that, that, that gives us a little bit of a, a little bit of a different image than we are than we're used to with, with you know God answering prayers and whatnot. Um, so his heart was one that sought after God. In 1 Samuel 13, 14 says, But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And he's talking. He's talking to um, uh, Saul. So, in uh, in sixteen seven, uh, God tells Samuel not to look at the outward appearance, but to look at the heart. Um, and that's just a general principle in, in life. We like to look at how good something looks rather than how it actually is. Um, so. 
chapters 1 through 15 are, are a period of transition. You've got Samuel being called, and he kind of, you know, um, the whole line, Eli's line gets kind of moved out, out, of, out of center stage. Um, and, and Samuel picks up, and then you have the rise of the monarch monarchy, and you eventually see Saul's heart. A lot of development in 15 chapters. Um, and then in 16 through 31, you have David's rise while Saul is declining. But yet you still don't have David as king. So he goes from Saul's court to Saul's army to being at odds with Saul and being chased all around the, uh, all around the nation to him being with the Philistines and Saul dying. I mean, you, you just kind of have this question of, where is the promise? Where is this going, you know? Um, and then, you know, uh, St. Samuel picks up, and he he, he uh, has great respect for King Saul still. Even after all the dumb stuff that he did, he, did, he still respected his authority and submitted himself to that. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's noteworthy. The, the, man, the man who is submitted to God he tends to be humble. He tends to be submissive. He doesn't tend to be a troublemaker, always looking for something to rebel and fight over. You know, I think that's that needs to be noted. Now, obviously, David was not perfect even before he messed up in his kingship. Um, but regardless of his mistakes, he did seek after the Lord. So, uh, regarding the evil spirit that comes on Saul in chapter 16, um, a lot of people, th this bothers them because, once again, this is another area that it seems like God is, is being unjust. Just like it, just like in Genesis, where it says that um, and that God was, was sorry that he, uh, when the people are sinning in, in the beginning of Genesis, it says that God was sorry. Now people say, oh no, no, God can't feel sorry. Uh, actually, yeah, he can. See, just because someone is ha knows what will happen, just because God knows what will happen, okay, does not mean that he does not experience in time. God exists outside of time, but he still, he still is involved in time, and he still experiences things when they happen. Um, and, and so, he is God unchanging? Yes, God is unchanging, and yet he's able to experience. How does that work? Well, that's a, that's a discussion for your theology class. But um, for this, it's important to notice that, that, once again, like I said in the introduction, let God be God in the Old Testament. Don't try to just explain away the things, try to learn from them instead. God was so grieved in his heart from what the people were doing that he despaired of even making them. He despaired of even making them. That's a kind of a big deal. And, and so, once again, let God be God. He's, he doesn't have to answer it as he does his own way. But remember that his way is higher than ours, and so a lot of times we'll perceive him to be wrong because of our experience when he was right. Okay, um, so uh, understand that in the Old Testament, God oftentimes acts in a way that, that is just unexpected. Um, in fact, I'll take a brief look back now. I kind of skipped over him, but in, in the life of Jacob in Genesis. You know he's doing all this stuff and any and he, he flees you know his father because I'm sorry not his father his brother because his brother says that he's gonna kill him because he stole the birthright and the blessing um, and, you know Esau gives away the his his birthright for soup um, and once again we like to scoff at that but just think about that honestly they didn't have a Walmart you know you could have actually thought that he was gonna die um, so uh, then eventually the time comes and and, and Jacob listens to his mother and connives his way to get his um, his brother's uh, firstborn blessing. Um, and so Esau is so mad that he's going to kill him. Jacob takes off, um, according to his mother's advice, and goes to the land, uh, land to up to around Haran area where Abraham's father had died, and uh, uh, kind of chills out there and works 14 years for for his two wives. Seven years for the one, but then yeah, his dad, his father-in-law, uh, tricks him, and so he has to work another seven years for the other wife. But Laban gives him the wife before he's finished it up his seven years. Okay, so that makes sense. So he works seven years, gets two wives, and then works another seven years to pay off the second wife. So, um, and then he, this is something interesting. Uh, he tries to do this thing where he only takes a speckled sheep. Um, you know, and so he's doing this thing while they're mating. Um, but as far as I know, that doesn't work at all. You know that that that's completely fictional. That's not not true. And yet, J 
Jacob ends up with the better sheep, and they're speckled. So once again, God is intervening in the situation. Interesting, you know, that, that, that Jacob is being manipulative. As Laban, they're manipulating each other. Okay, And yet God is looking out for Jacob's best interest. Once again, the blessings of God just following and overtaking the patriarchs of Israel. So, I so say that to bring us back to this. Not always does God, when God acts out of character, you know, is it something like that though? Sometimes, I say out of character, God always acts according to his character. He never acts against that. I should say, when God acts contrary to how we think he should act. Um, and this th that picks us up with here. And this evil spirit comes on Saul as, as the anointing of the Holy Spirit is removed from King Saul. So how did, what is all this about? Well, first off, it's important to note that, that this was probably for, for, for punishment against his actions. Yes. But then also it was uh, probably for, for to draw him into repentance. Remember, God wants to, wants to, wants to reconcile himself with people. Just because people are hard-headed doesn't mean that God gives up on them. He, he works on them and he tries different things, which once again... Um, we know that everything that he does is, is good, regardless of whether we agree with it. So then uh, David and Goliath, uh, you know, one of, probably the foundational aspect of 1 Samuel, um, Goliath is this huge giant that comes from the army of Philistine, the Philistines. And, um, uh, you know, he's just, he's just so big. And everybody's intimidated. And David says, no, 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 you've come against our God. And, and, and you know, that needs to be dealt with. So in 1736, it says, um, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. Now, um, with this, um, as you're studying, ask yourself questions like, why did he say living God? It's important. Uh, but then also, um, it's important to note that, that, that Saul here is big, and yet he's cowering in fear. David is this, you know, this, this, this little shepherd boy. Yet he is he is standing up for 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 God and for what God is doing. Um, so then he says, you know, you come against me with with a, a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I came to you and come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. Um, and, and he says this, says a spiel here, um, and, and he basically leaves the results up to uh, to God. Uh, verses 45 through 47 there. So this is this is a picture once again. Uh, I just got we did a did an internet search and, and found all these maps, you know. So um, I, I I hope I'm not stealing anything, you know. Um, I did not all the pictures that you see in this. I had nothing to do with. Um, they are taken by other people and uploaded to the internet, um, and I didn't see any any claims on them. But I just don't remember where I got them from. So. Um, but Saul's camp's over here. There's Soka and, and Judah, and here's the creek here that he he drew the uh, he drew the um, the stones from. Here's uh, the Philistine camp over here. Okay, right here. Here's the Valley of Elah. Now here is the uh, Sharaim road that the Philistines uh, fled on. Okay, and the picture it says here on the bottom was taken from Ezekiel. All right, so. And that takes us to Second Samuel, which begins with David's rise to power um, in, in Judah in chapters one through four, and then David's reign over all Israel in chapters five through twenty-four. Now, um, it kind of has an outline like this: five through ten is good things happening, eleven through twelve is the sin with Bathsheba, and then thirteen through twenty-four is bad things. Um, so you, you, the the central aspect of Second Samuel is David's sin with Bathsheba. You know, and once again, cautionary tale: if you're if you're in pornography or sexual immorality of any kind, the same thing happens um, with us. You know, oh, everybody else is wrong. Oh, we should kill that man who who did this to this guy and, and took his one his one sheep. And then Nathan the prophet says, David, you are that man. You took this man's one wife when you have all kinds of wives, and you could have had others besides. I mean, there are other virgins in in Israel, but you had to take this man's wife. You know. Um, and so you see how sin leads to more sin. First off, David is, you know, whatever the heck he's doing, uh, sitting at home while his armies are at war. It says the time when the kings went out to war 
and he's at and he's you know reclining. It's in the middle of the middle of the day, and he's reclining. Sometimes you fall into temptation because you're in the wrong place when you should be somewhere else doing something else. Uh, for those of you who are on things like pornography, for instance, you're at home alone with the internet, and then lo and behold, the two of you will meet. It's just a matter of time, you know. And it's the exact same thing with this. I mean, David was a man who never. <laughs> really, as far as I understand, learn to, to, I guess you could say, control his lusts. And so then the time of testing comes and he was unable to, to succeed because he hadn't built that in him throughout his whole life. You know, um, I mean, God did say, you know, don't accumulate for yourself lots of wives. If he would have, people think that the more wives you have or the more women you have in your life, the more happy you'll be. But the more you have, the more you'll want. And uh, David didn't understand that. Um, so, um, you know, and, and then that th this causes him to commit adultery, murder, and he killed a lot of other people, and got a lot of other people killed besides Uriah, and killed other people too. You can read the account for yourself. But, um, now, the Gibeonites, um, it mentions them in 21, uh, 1 through 2. This was a people that in Joshua 9, 3 through 5, and, 14 through 15, and, and verses 14 through 15 of chapter 9, um, Joshua accidentally makes a truce, a covenant with them. Okay, um, they pretend like they're someone else, and so Joshua, you know, okay, we'll, we'll protect you. But then he finds out that they're actually the Gibeonites, that they live in Canaan, and they were supposed to destroy them, and you know they still stick to their word and protect them. Um, but what had happened was King Saul um, got overzealous. You know, when you mess up spiritually, you try to overcompensate in other areas. And that's exactly what King Saul did. He's messing up. So what does he do? Oh, well, I'll drive out the Gibeonites. Well, yes, except his zeal was misplaced. You see, they had still made that covenant. And because King Saul broke that covenant, um, a famine comes on the land. And David asks, you know, what's going on here, God? And he tells him, well, uh, the Gibeonites need to be reconciled. Um, and so because of it, King's... Uh, King Saul's kids had to pay the price for his sin. So, um, God makes a covenant with King David in chapter 7, 8 through 17. Uh, now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. And he goes on this basically saying, you know, this is where you came from. Okay, Don't think that you're so high and mighty. This is where you came from. Now this is what I'm going to do for you. You know, and... Uh, because David has it set in his heart to build this tower and this this temple, and Nathan says, "Yeah, that's a good thing to do." And then God tells him, "No, no, no, go tell him that not to build." It. And he says, "Okay." Um, so this is what he tells him, um, and you know it's it's very very interesting to note that that you know here he is trying to build God's name up, and God says, "You know, forget that. I'm going to build your name up." And this covenant is very important because once again Jesus was born through David's offspring. Um, with that covenant. It's a covenant that's followed all throughout the Old Testament, really. Um, so a lot of times they'll say, on account of my servant David, you know, um, I will not destroy you on account of my servant David. So some some, some things going on with 2 Samuel. Um, in chapter 1, 11 through 16, David killed the man who claimed to have killed King Saul. Um, once again, because King Saul was the king. They, were you not afraid to kill the Lord's anointed? You know, this I believe really is a cautionary tale. Sometimes, a lot of times actually, people don't have a, don't have a, don't need any help in rebellion. They rebel all by themselves. And um, so, uh, so what happens here though is is, 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 is David says, you know, this man was the Lord's anointed. He was the king. Regardless of whether you think a leader is good or not, be very careful with rebellion. You know, it, it's it's very rarely justified. Very very rarely. Um, but yeah, we try to find it as, oh, no, this is, this is something that happens, and, and it's good even. No, 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 the attitude of rebellion is not good. There are some times when God has ordained a rebellion for certain reasons, but it's important to note that God, you know, did direct those things, okay? Um, and, and for the most of the part, he says, the general principle, the general rule is that you should be submitted to your authorities. You know, always looking. We don't shouldn't always go to the to the extreme examples of rebellion and say, okay, this is an ex a model for all of us to rebel. No, no, it's not. So David is finally king in chapter two, verses one through seven. This is about ten ten to nine seventy one somewhere in there. Uh, finally, after you know all this long wait, um, 
and you know he, ha he 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 has this lament for for King Saul, and it really shows his character. Um, Jerusalem enters the picture in chapter five, and we'll talk about Jerusalem more, but it really becomes the epicenter of Israelite activity and prophecy as well. Um, you know, even though um, the land of Palestine wasn't God's, you know, God had a bigger plan in mind than the land of Israel. Um, but um, but Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, does still play play a big part. So he so he kicks the people out that have, that have been living there, and he sets sets up shop there. Um, and then he tries to build God a, a tabernacle there in chapter seven. But it's interesting to note that the temple was not God's ideal. And the temple was not God's ideal. He allowed it, but he was not necessarily overly concerned with it. You know, so um, I think he was more concerned that it was important to David. <laughs> um, so once again, you don't get too too caught up with, you know, where a physical te temple is today. You know, we are the temple of the Most High God, um, and and so remember that, and remember how that applies as you're reading through Leviticus. So. Also, I already talked about the sin leads to more sin. You know, David does one thing and it leads him to do a series of other things. Um, so, uh, also we see that sin destroys hard work. In chapter 15 of Second Samuel, um, Absalom is, is setting up this conspiracy, and, 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 and David, it says that David had to flee Jerusalem. He had done all this hard work, set up this, this kingdom, united the peoples, and because of his rebellion, his son rebels. I'm sorry, not rebellion. Because of his sin, his son rebels against him. Um, and then, you know, it just has this long slew of bad stuff happening uh, because of this. Now, now, some people would say King David wasn't that great of a leader because he, you know, he didn't appoint a, 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 an heir. He was unable to quelch this rebellion. All this different bad stuff were happening. No, this bad stuff was happening not because he was a bad leader. It was happening as punishment. God said that earlier. Um, and, and, you know, uh, David was trusting the Lord to resolve the issue. He wasn't trusting in his own strength, though he could have and gotten more people killed. Um, but sin does destroy hard work. Um, we also see that righteousness affects others. Um, in chapter 24 through 25, it says... Um, David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Thus the Lord was moved by prayer for the land, and the plague was held back from Israel. So um, so then Solomon enters the picture in chapter 12, and he begins his reign at the beginning of 1 Kings in 971 to 930. Um, now Solomon is called you know, the wisest person, um, and, and <clears throat> he definitely does you know, show that in, in a lot of areas. Um, but uh, 12, 24 uh, through 25 mentions Solomon's birth. Um, he was actually the daughter of, uh, of Bathsheba. So, um, and so this is just a picture of the United um, Israelite Kingdom. Israel in the times of King Saul, David, and Solomon, 1000 to 924. I would say about 930 actually, but still. Um, so the lands conquered by King David are these ones here. You can see how he really expanded the empire. Uh, and the Israelite kingdom under King Saul is just pretty much these these hills here in Judah and whatnot. Okay? A little bit here and a little bit there. So you can see that that, that really there's a big difference between Saul's empire and, 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 and David's David's empire. And I should say kingdom really. Um, but you can see the Ammonites over here on the on the side here, the Moabites there, the Edomites here, the Malachites there, the Philistines there, Sidonians, the Tyrants of Sidon there, uh, the Arameans or the Syrians here, also called the people of Damascus. Um, so um, then um, at the end of King Solomon's reign, um, we have the kingdom united under his, I mean, not united, divided under his son. And uh, I'll stop after this, um, just give you some, some little history here. Now, Israel is called by many names throughout the prophets and whatnot. It's called, you know, um, it's traditionally it's called nor the northern kingdom. It's called Israel. It's called the tribe of jo and Joseph. Sometimes it's called the tribe of Ephraim, but keep in mind that sometimes they're actually referring to the tribe itself. Um, it's called uh, Samaria. 
Uh, it really has this whole slew of different names. Sometimes when it says these things, it's talking about the whole of Israel. Sometimes it's talking about all of the children of Israel. Sometimes it's talking about a specific tribe of Israel. So it's really just important to pay attention to the context and just kind of know where, what it's talking about. Um, so in, in 937.22 it is, is when it existed. Um, it fell by Assyria um, in 722. Um there are very few recorded prophets for Israel, and there's a lot of reasons for that that I've touched on before. First off is that they ignored the warnings. Second off, uh, their heart was hardened. Um, uh, third off, they were not in covenant with God. Israel as the northern kingdom was never in covenant with the Lord. They were not of David's descendants. They did not reaffirm him in um, in any religious aspect. In fact, they set up you know cultic places and stuff like that. Um, also, they opposed David's house. Um, which is probably not a good idea. Um, but then also, uh, there were some prophets just not recorded. All right, some of them were recorded in other books, like Elijah and Elisha. So, um, they were really very evil. Um, they practiced what's called Canaanite Baalism, um, basically worshiping Baal, who is the, god of, the storm god, and, and, and Asherah, who in some accounts seems to be maybe his mother, wife of El, um, but then in other accounts, it seems like maybe they're not related at all. It's very hard to know who Asherah is or where she even comes from. Um, but Bill, you know, once again, the Canaanite religions was very, very mixed. There really was no set religion. This is what we believe. And there's really no set people. You know, Canaanite was just kind of a jumble pot, you know, so. Um, so the kings of, the kings of, of Israel are listed here. Uh, with their most likely um, dates, as you can see, with the different prophets that, that we know of kind of interspersed. Jeroboam the first, who was the first to rebel, you know, now watch this, he rebelled against Solomon, and Solomon had, you know, he ran to Egypt, but then when his son came, to, came he came back, see what I mean? Um, and, and with that being said, he did stir up a rebellion, and then also I want to point something out. King Saul caused some problems that King David had to solve. You know, sometimes... Um, in life, you get to a position and you have to resolve an issue that really sucks and it's not your fault, but you still have to resolve it. So Jeroboam reigns from about 930 to 910. These are approximate dates on a lot of this. Nadab is 910 to 909. Basha 909 to 886. Elah 886 to 885. Zimri 885 reigns a very short period. I think it's like six months or something like that. Uh, Zimri, um, I already said that. Uh, Omri, 885 to 874. Ahab, Omri and Ahab are actually pretty big figures. Omri was one of the most um, good political leaders that Israel had. In fact, I believe it was Assyria or Babylon referred not to, to Israel as the house of Omri. Not the house of Israel, not the house of David, the house of Omri. Um, so he was very powerful. Now, it's interesting to note that because Omri and Ahab were two of the, mo two of the most wicked kings um, in Israel's recorded history, and it actually spends a good deal of, of the Book of Kings talking about talking about Ahab. Um, so Elijah and Elisha uh, prophesy or, or do their works around that time. Um, now, now something else. Um, oh, I'll wait on that. Ahaziah reigns after Ahab in 853 to 852. Now, if you notice, um, the the names in, that are boldened are good are are, are called by kings good kings, okay? By the books of kings, it's called, they're referred to as good kings or righteous kings. Um, and if you look, there are absolutely no names in bold here. So there are, there is not a single king thus far in Israel that uh, first or second kings calls good. Um, so Ahaziah 853 to 852, only a year. Joram from about 852 to 841. Jehu 841 to 814. Jehoahaz 814 to 798, Jehoash 798 to 782. Now, at this time, things are starting to get a little bit, you know, probably, probably hectic. You know, there's there's been a few prophets, or there's been a few things mentioned going on, and still the people aren't listening. So Jeroboam II, 793 to 753. I believe Jeroboam II, if I'm remembering correctly, had the potential to be a good king, and he started off good. You know, he killed all these people of Bel, um, but then. I don't know what happened. He lost his fuel or something, and, and you know, 
that was the end of that. <laughs> so I, I, I think it was Jeroboam the second, but whoever it was, he was almost a good king, but you know he wasn't. So it was during Jeroboam the second's reign that we have Amos and Hosea, um, and their prophecies. Uh, so then we have Zechariah in 753, Shalem in 752, Men Men Menahem in 751 to 742, Pekahiah in 741 to 740, Pekah in 740 to 732, Hosea in 732 to 722. And Hosea is the king, um, the last king of Israel, and Israel is conquered by Assyria, um, who, who, do, who once again is on, is on the resurgence, I guess you could say, and, and makes a big campaign, goes down and and, and takes control over over Israel. Uh, it chips a good chunk out of out of Judah as well. Now this is the beginning of the Samaritans. We're going to follow the history of the Samaritans, and then when I upload, a, I'm going to upload a New Testament class. When I do that, it'll pick up on on the history of the Samaritans and kind of show why there was such um, disunity between the Israelites um, and the um, uh, Samaritans. Um, so. Uh, Okay, and so that takes us to Judah. What was happening with Judah during during, during Israel while well, Israel was doing all this? First off, um, the names. Judah is called Judah. It's called the Southern Kingdom. It's called Jerusalem. It's called Zion. You know, it's called sometimes it's called the people of Israel. Um, so uh, they exist as a, as a separate kingdom from 930 to 586. Um, so kind of a kind of a good deal of time for them to exist. Um, they the 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 people who reigned there were David's descendants. In fact, if you read in First and Second Chronicles, it only follows David's line. Um. <clears throat> so tribes, uh, Judah and and and, and somewhat Benjamin. It, it's kind of once again the numbering of of the tribes. I'll let you read it for yourself, but it mentions you know, uh, it kind of just doesn't even mention it. You um. Mentioned that, that the southern kingdom has Benjamin as well. Um, so, uh, but then eventually a, man, a, a, a king comes by in, in Judah. His name is Manasseh, um, the son of Hezekiah, I believe. Yeah, the son of Hezekiah. And he's called more wicked than the Canaanites. So he, we've, you've got the most wicked king. He's more wicked than even the people who God had called them to drive out. And uh, Chronicles mentions his, his repentance, but uh, Kings does not. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So the Kings, Rehoboam was Solomon's uh, you know, son, 930-914. Abijah in 913-910. Asa and Jehoshaphat both mentioned as good kings. Not as good as they could have been, but still good. Uh, Asa 909-868 and Jehoshaphat from 872-847. Followed by three bad kings, Jehoram, Ahaziah, and Athaliah. Um, 853 to 841, 841 to 835. Now, Joash, now if I remember correctly, Athaliah was actually a, 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 a woman, a queen, um, and then she killed off all the royal family so that she could have the throne for herself. I believe that was Athaliah. But Joash comes in and actually uh, starts kind of a, a revival in the nation um, in 835 to 796. Um, and the thing about... Um, Joash, if I'm remembering correctly, um, he he could have he could have really done a lot of a lot of good, but he he goes and he tries to stop um, Assyria. I'm sorry, not Assyria. I believe it's the Pharaoh that he tries to stop. Um, I want to say that was Joash, um, and and he gets in this fight with with the Philistines, and uh, he he dies. Um, his reign's kind of cut short. Um, but anyways, uh, then Am Amaziah, um, if, if this is what I'm thinking of, and that, and the Pharaoh did kill Joash, Amaziah was set up by the Pharaoh. He reigns from 796 to 767. Uh, Uzziah reigns um, 791 to 739. Um, if you look, there's a little bit of an overlap there. Um, so Isaiah is um, 740 to 700. Uh, and you can see this is about the time that he that he reigned. In fact, uh, one of Isaiah's prophecies says, "In the year that King Uzziah died." So Jotham was from 750 to 732, uh, and Micah prophesied during this time from 737 to 690. If you look, Isaiah and Micah prophesied at some of the same times. So that takes us to King Ahaz, 736 to 720, and then King Hezekiah, 
who is is overall a righteous king, does some dumb stuff, but we'll get into that. Um, actually, I'll get into that one now. Um, now, some of these kings had multiple names as recorded in like Jeremiah, for instance. But what happens with Hezekiah is he, you know, he, he's in trouble with Assyria, and he seeks after the Lord. And, you know, even though his empire is drastically, uh, his kingdom, I should say, is drastically reduced um, by Assyria, um, he does still still expand it. He does still um, seek after the Lord in that time. And he's getting ready to die, and he asks the Lord to save him. And he says, Lord, remember remember my righteousness. Remember that I didn't serve my own way. And when he says this, you know, I honestly wouldn't have condoned someone appealing to their own righteousness for God. But regardless, God listens and uh, heals him. And uh, once again, God acting in a way that seems contrary. You just got to let God be God. Um, and... Uh, after he is healed, he has a son named Manasseh, who becomes the most wicked king in recorded Israelite history. Um, so then, in biblical, I mean. Um, and, and then uh, he also shows uh, the Babylonian uh, emissaries his, his, his riches, which the prophet then says, I believe it was Isaiah says, you know, that was very dumb. They're going to remember and they're going to they're gonna be back. Um, and... Once again, um, the the emissaries from Babylon, they were just at this point they they were they were you know looking at what they could do to overthrow Assyria. So, um, so this this you have it here: Philistia, Phoenicia, Aram, Ammon, Moab, Edom, Judah, and Israel. Um, now keep in mind some of the tribes moved around um, at, at the time. Excuse me, at the time of the judges. So, um, that takes us to the Song of, Song of Solomon, which I will pick up with next time. Um, this 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 video went a little long, so uh, we'll pick up with that next uh, next time. Thank you for watching.